So we have now uh, time for discussion, and uh, I take the privilege of being here on stage and to ask you the first question, which is, uh, I don't understand why uh, the, the taboo on cousin marriage uh, leads to all these psychological changes. So what, is the, what, is the, what are the plausible mechanisms behind right. that? It would be nice if you yeah, could elaborate absolutely. on that, and so, then um, I have no further questions. That, okay. so, so great question. I should have made this clearer. Uh, what, the way cousin marriage works is it allows you to intensify your relationships within a certain group. So when people are marrying their cousins, they're typically in a typical clan system. You're creating a relationship between two clans. So, not to give you too much anthropology, but a widespread system would be you can marry your mother's brother's children or your father's sister's children. Those are cross cousins. But your classificatory siblings are your parallel cousins, and those are the other relationships. And what this means is you can't marry anyone in your clan, but you can build relationships with other clans. So what you're doing is building a tight network of relationships among your clans. If you outlaw that and you keep making it further and further out to six cousins, now you have to marry a stranger from a distant city. So now rather than in, you know, creating a network that's very tight and cross-cutting, you're creating these distance ties, these extensive ties to faraway places. So now you have a relationship with a distant community, a distant family, instead of uh, a tighter and tighter network of ties locally. Okay, thank you. Questions? Uh, there's a question there. <clears throat> Fascinating talk. Um, the, the thing that puzzles me a little bit is that cousin marriage doesn't seem essential to Catholic doctrine. It's uh, neither about the resurrection nor about the Holy Trinity. It's like this completely peripheral add-on that <clears throat> then seems to take over this gigantically important role in your narrative. And I'm wondering whether there isn't something that you can argue about pre-existing conditions, cultural dispositions, inclinations of people in these areas that then find the Catholic doctrine very agreeable as long as they uh, can actually adapt it to their own cultural preferences that might actually be skewing your results, that these people are actually weird pre-Catholic contact. Okay, um, a bunch of thoughts there. So the first thing in your question is that... Um, uh, cousin marriage in Christianity. So I, I try to emphasize the point that it's specifically this variant of Christianity. Now this variant goes on to be the 90% the of Christians today are descendants of this particular variant. But at the time, you might have bet on Eastern Christianity because the power was all in Byzantium and uh, Constantinople at the time. And you know, so he had an emperor behind him and just much, there's also a Syriac church and um, a number of other churches. And, but yet this is the one that wins because this is the one that adopted this strange set of taboos. It's not, you know, you can't find it in the Bible. If you go back to the Old Testament, they were polygynists, there was cousin marriage. By tradition, Jesus was the product of cross cousins. Um, so that, that's all standard, you know, anthropological type stuff. So then the question is, why did this group, and maybe there was something about the tribes of, of Northern Europe that made them particularly amenable. They don't seem to have been amenable. So there are these letters that go back and forth from the missionaries that the Pope's sending out. So this famous letter from a monk named Augustine who's been dispatched to the Anglo-Saxons in 600. And he writes back to the Pope with nine questions. Five of them were about you know, uh, questions of imposing cousin marriage and getting rid of secondary wives and, and things like that. And the Pope kind of grants a dispensation, essentially saying that, you know, it's okay, just let's make them just not marry their first cousins. We don't want to go too far. Um, it's, and, so, and then other groups later hear about this, and they're like, hey, well, what about us? Can we marry only, can we marry our second cousins? And the Pope's like, no, no, you've been in the church too long. So there's definitely pushback and definitely bargaining. Um, now, we don't have that much, we don't have detailed knowledge of uh, the kinship systems of these, of these pre-Christian groups, but all the scattered bits and pieces make it look like they were pretty standard issue anthropological complex kinship groups. So they had polygyny, um, they had some amount of cousin marriage, they had, um, if you look at the, one place we have it is languages. So the languages do the standard things that you would find in lots of different groups by differentiating sides of the families and naming cousins, all this kind of thing. Um, 
So that would suggest that their systems were not appreciably different. Now, if there could have been some small variation, uh, that's possible. Um, so. other, other questions? Here is a question. Oh, are there questions up there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it working? Okay. So thank you. Um, I want to comment on, so you've showed a very compelling story and the maps of the SkinChamp index and all these indicators you're looking at, uh, the colors match very nicely, but to what extent is there real cause or evidence here? Shouldn't we be able to, or shouldn't we identify, for example, trust before the church intervenes and then afterwards to determine whether this has a causal relationship here? Right, so uh, one of the things that I'm trying to introduce here is um, the idea of combining historical data and contemporary data. So in the book and in this talk, you only got to see a little bit of it, I tack back and forth between data that allows me to anchor stuff in history and show historical trends like you saw a little bit on markets and urbanization, and then contemporary data where we can run psychological experiments and test the causal theory. So I showed you the evidence about markets uh, and the outcome variable there. In terms of the kinship data, um, I mean, I, I showed you quite a, quite a lot of data. It's, it's hard to tell a story, an alternative story, and I'm interested in one if someone has one, that can account for those patterns better than the one we've offered, which was suck, suck, the, suck. You know, scientific approach. Since you were talking about uh, genomics, are there certain genes in a classical picture of genomics which are responsible for the culture or your or my cultural behavior? Um, so let's see, there's a bunch of ways to answer that question. So first, we, uh, we have a lot of genetic evidence. And one of the ways we benchmark our measures of, from the Ethnographic Atlas is we can show that our measures of kinship complexity are correlated with actual measures of inbreeding across these diverse societies. So that allows us to show that these practices that are reported by anthropologists and you know, collated in the 1950s actually appear, we can see them in the, in the DNA. Now, in terms of whether uh, genes could be affecting the behavior of contemporary populations in psychology, um, these we're comparing, so first of all, Europeans are well mixed, and I think this is a story about why they're so well mixed. So when we, when we find differences amongst Europeans within the same regions that are side by side, a genetic explanation is unlikely because these are so well mixed. Um, and there's also this uh, urban graveyard effect in history. So, Urban centers, charter towns, and the, the phenomena I described are core to the, producing the kind of psychology I explained. But actually, I think a case can be made that they would work against genes for this. Because if you had a gene, say you had a uh, gene that made you more trusting in strangers, or a gene that made you have more analytic thinking, you might be attracted to these towns. You go to the towns and you die. Because the towns are, you know, they, they need this constant inflow of migration just to maintain their populations. So if anything, genetic evolution would have been running in the opposite direction. So, Thomas? How do you classify uh, cont whole countries as belonging either to the Western or um, uh, Eastern Church when, if these entities didn't even exist at the time or over the period? So um, we use a technique in economics uh, called the migration matrix. And so we take the contemporary compositions of populations, and then we can track them back to where they were in 1500. And then we look at the exposure that those different populations have in 1500. So if you track back to Africa, then the church wasn't there in 1500, so there's no exposure. If they track back to Germany or Europe, then we have an exposure measure. And so then we cobble that back up and give that country a score. OK, there's a question over there. Um, my question is um, about, you spoke about, uh, about uh, the Christianity and bringing about the cousin in marriages, etc. Now coming from India, uh, there I think the religion is so strict, institutionalized in case that you cannot have in cousin marriages that even if today somebody gets married, chances are that the person might get killed by the, by the larger clan. So uh, that is one, but then I also had mixed feelings about connecting all this development based on, on, on how church did it. So then I would assume countries in South America, which are highly Catholic and follow that church, should be way developed, one. And then if you take recent example of China's emergence, then of course that uh, construct of church doesn't exist there, but it's also making quite a bit of economic strides. Uh, 
So I'm very confused in my mind as to what should I read from your uh, presentation. Okay, I want to come back to your question um, about uh, India because I didn't quite get it. But in terms of Latin America, I mean, they just get folded in. So um, in terms of their cousin marriage descent, they have European populations, but they also have quite large indigenous populations. Whereas in the US, I mean, the indigenous population is close to zero. So, I mean, that's going to create variation and that variation, you know, our approach helps to account for that explanation. Did you mention China? Yeah, so um, two things about China that I think is interesting. The first is, so I'm telling this one part of the story. Another part of the story is that having a long history of states has probably affected people in terms of things like time preferences and um, other things that make you able to operate effectively under a state. So, uh, populate, so China is the oldest state, and so that's going to have that's going to have an effect. And then what people don't realize, and Ernst talked about how China adopted modern institutions, but uh, I, can't, I can't believe how, how un... So people don't realize China adopted modern marriage in 1950. And they, modern marriage, they called it. I'm using their term. Uh, so they ended polygyny. They outlawed uh, first-degree cousin, uh, first-degree relative relationships. In 1980, they outlawed cousin marriage, first degree, uh, first cousins. Um, they ended arranged marriage and required bilateral inheritance. So they basically implemented a whole bunch of aspects of the church's program, except they, you know, they're the Chinese government, so they implemented it much faster than, than the church was able to do over centuries. So. Um, just a counter one if I get a chance, but what about colonialism and getting the wealth out of those nations back to the Western countries? So all the countries which you were asking as being fair, etc. They were heavily involved in colonialism as well. And where there was slavery, there was free access to, to raw materials, etc. Does that uh, might have also played a role in, in the prosperity? Well, that may have played a role in the prosperity, but I'm, I'm focused on psych... Well, I mean, I'm interested in the prosperity, but the data I showed you is all about psychology. So you would have to have some story that connects the colonialism stuff to the psychology. We also include those. Myself and Ben Anke has also done this. Try to include measures of colonialism uh, in as a control, so there's that. There's a question over there in the, behind the previous. Thank you. Uh, individualism as part of a national culture was, in my mind, usually associated to Protestantism, and now I learn that it goes back to Catholic Church. Is there any influence of Protestant Church? I mean, Max Weber wrote a lot about that and said this was very influential for modern development. Can you detect any influence at all? Yeah, so I, I, I you know, it's a big book. It's uh, 150,000 words. Um, so you got the short version. Um, so part of what I'm doing here is I'm explaining how you create a world where Protestantism would be an interesting idea that could diffuse. So Protestantism is very... Um, weird in the sense that uh, one of the core tenets of Protestantism is that each individual can build a personal relationship with an all-powerful supernatural being by reading the te sec sacred text by themselves. And this, the wooden cell in, in hierarchical society where it's the old guys who know everything, so you needed to create a world where that idea could sell for Protestantism to diffuse. So part of this is getting to Protestantism, so that's my, my answer to the Weber puzzle. And then I think that Protestantism did have real effects. It did have, it's kind of like these effects, but uh, amped up or, or accelerated. Um, of course, there's an independent effect of, of Protestantism, which is increase in literacy. So people begin to learn to read because they think that's how you get closer to God. And this reading has downstream implications. You actually become a bit more analytic when you learn to read. There's also effects on perception. Um, and just to, uh, since I'm talking about this, I'll make this point. Reading is my favorite example for how culture changes our biology without changing our genes. So when you learn to read, you get a specialized part of your brain in, in the left hemisphere that's specialized for recognizing letters. letters. And uh, your verbal memory gets better, and your corpus callosum gets thicker. So um, as Protestants diffusing, corpus callosi are getting thicker because the training, what you have to do to learn to read, thickens those connections between there. Uh, so there is a biological change when you, when you spread something like literacy. And I also think there's evidence that Protestantism is going to increase patience. Um, but that is not well causally identified. Um, so. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So
Uh, we seem to have run out of questions. Uh, it's a bold hypothesis that you are putting forward. Uh, nothing less than a new explanation why capitalism emerged, it seems to me. At least that there are these psychological preconditions that favor the, the emergence of capitalism, which is quite interesting and I'm thinking this will be stuff for future discussions or even for decades to come. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture and thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. <clears throat>